Okay, so this chapter primarily deals with consolidating financial statements. So the first week we were talking about when there is um, a, a percent of um, investment in a company. And depending on that percent of investment, we use the equity method. And that was primarily what we talked about, the equity method and the fair value method. And then we talked about how we um, would report those on the um, parent company's financial statements. So this chapter covers when um, we have to consolidate the financial statements because one company either purchases another company's assets or where a company, um, different combinations as we're going to look at here. So, okay. so we're, we're taking it a step further in this chapter and how this um, combination needs to be reported on financial statements. <clears throat> so basically, why do companies combine? I mean, oftentimes companies combine to reduce competition. And um, when those companies combine, um, they can result in um, a whole new company. There's, there's various methods in which the combination can occur. But generally, we're going to um, talk about something new called the acquisition method in this chapter, how we um, report these on the financial statements. So, excuse me. Um, so, when there's a parent and there's a subsidiary and they remain um, operating independently, for financial statement purposes, because they are acting as one entity financially um, because of control, the parent can control the subsidiary, we still need to show that um, as a um, one entity on financial statements. Um, the, this slide just shows some of the um, companies recently um, that acquired other companies and the extent of the combination. Um, healthcare, energy companies, Google purchasing Motorola. I mean, just this week, uh, Medtronic purchased, I forget how big that um, acquisition was. Um, right. Yeah, out there. So, happens all the time. They do it basically. Or even the local one. I know. You hear about the stereo company? The yes, company. yes. Oh. A lo it wasn't that interesting? Yes. I thought it was, actually. Yeah, so, I mean, this happens all the time, and they need to be reported as such. So, again, why do they do it? Take away any competition. Um, Definitely, it gets them into the markets quicker by just going and purchasing um, yeah. instead of expansion. So, um, we need to combine them into a single set of financial statements. And basically, it really shows the consolidation as though it is acting as one entity. Um, e sometimes, they can retain separate, I their separate identities and they're still separate corporations, but... Um, even though, and, and even though they act in that way, if um, from a standpoint of accounting, um, we're required to report as one entity um, the financial statements. So, um, okay. as we move on here, let's just, we'll get to the problems, that's okay. where we learn, but... Um, different what manners in which enterprises can combine this is this is the key one sometimes there's what we call a statutory merger which they basically purchase the assets of another company and in that case that company that's being purchased just goes out of business and um, merges into one company other times they okay. just they purchase the stock of another company 
And again, that also dissolves. Um, that corporation that was purchased by the stock dissolves. And um, um, as it uh, a separate entity, um, acquisition of more than 50% of the voting stock. If that's the case, then the way in which we um, would handle that is showing that stock as an investment similar to what we've done in, in the previous chapter. We show it as investment in a certain company. And, um, right. yeah. So, anyway, different manners of combinations, and we're going to focus on a couple of them. So when we have to consolidate financial statements and if the one company that's being um, purchased dissolves, then we basically have to transfer any of those balances in the accounts into the, um, we have to add them to the balances of the um, retaining company but if they keep a separate entity even though they consolidate but that company keeps a separate entity then we would only on the financial statements show it being consolidated the actual records are going to have two separate sets of companies but for financial reporting purposes we'll use work papers to show them as a single entity just for financial statement purposes. And then when there is a consolidation, we're going to have to report it on the date in which those two companies did combine. So all of this is just a real generic um, summary of how all this is going to work. Um, if they maintain their separate identities, then we have to, um, and, and they're being purchased over a period of time, then we have to consolidate them over those periods of time in which they purchased greater percents of the company. Um, a couple different methods, <coughs> but <clears throat> we're going to look at what we call the acquisition method. We're basically similar to a purchase we're going to take those the fair value of the various assets on the date when the company was acquired. Because technically a purchase is basically um, then restating the various financial statements to that value of the various assets when the company was acquired. Um, in using this method, what we call the acquisition method, any consideration or cash or any assets that were transferred in the, um, the process of the purchase um, need to be considered. And we need to look at what we actually bought. So um, just like in Chapter 1, we're going to take a look at all the various assets, come up with their fair values, and determine um, the value for the specific assets that were purchased. And if we have excess consideration for the assets, then we know that's going to be goodwill, just like we did in the previous chapter. Yeah. Now, if what we purchase is um, the consideration we give is less than all the assets combined, at the date of acquisition, we, we may have a gain, which we call from a bargain purchase. So this is something new in this chapter we're going to look at. <clears throat> so in other words, instead of, um, let for example, let's say we purchased a company for a million dollars, but if we take the fair value of all the various assets, they come to a million five. We show that fair value, and we in, we immediately have a gain on the purchase of a company. Now, there is a method, um, we, well, fair value. We've talked about fair value. It's basically 
going to be the price um, that we would be that would be received to sell an asset or transfer a liability between market participants. So it's basically an arm's length exchange of what the values really um, are in a market between um, a buyer and a seller. The market approach basically is where um, you can estimate those values using other potential um, assets or liabilities from um, similar types of transactions. We have something called an income approach where we look at future cash flows related to assets. So there are a couple different ways in which it can be measured. Um, and we're going to probably focus more on this market approach. Um, so with okay. this acquisition method, um, there's, um, as we did in the first chapter, if the consideration or the, the cash and stock that we transfer doesn't equal the value of all the assets um, or that we acquire, we may have something called goodwill. And we will show it as an intangible asset on the financial statements. But if what we provide in consideration is less than the fair value of the assets, we got a deal and we have to show that as a gain right away. So that's new here. So in the method of going through this process, we'll have to determine the fair value of um, what we transfer and what we acquire related to the various assets. And so we can right away determine if we've got goodwill or if we've got a gain. Um, now, when we have these this consolidation, we, um, depending on if the company that we are acquiring automatically gets dissolved, then we'll have um, that company is no longer in existence and all the assets will be transferred to the new company. But when we have an acquisition and they keep operating as separate entities, then the consolidation process becomes a little more complicated. So the first step we're going to do is start with creating a journal entry to record that consolidation. So as you see here, the this is pretty straightforward because we have the fair value of various assets and the liabilities that we acquired. And it shows here we purchased with 550000 in cash. And um, we um, acquired some stock, or we, we purchased it with cash and with stock. And it shows this lines up, the fair value assets of the assets totally equal what we um, provided for consideration. So consideration transferred is going to always, in this case, equals the net identified asset values. So there's no goodwill here. There's no gain on the bargain purchase. But when we have a consolidation <coughs> where what we provided in cash is greater than all the fair value of the assets, you can see right here that we will show goodwill. This intangible asset is the difference. Okay, so we acquired a company here, but the fair value of the assets were less than what we paid. So the difference will be a, a goodwill. You know, there's an intangible why we chose to purchase it for greater. If the consideration we gave to purchase the company is less than the fair value of all the assets down here at the bottom, then we'll have a gain in right um, at the beginning 
in purchasing this company. So the assets and the liabilities we acquired get reported here at the fair value. And yet what we provided in um, consideration is less than all the fair value of the assets. And in this case, immediately we show a gain on purchasing this company because everything has to be reported at fair value of the assets. So there are times when a gain happens right away. Now, when one company purchases another but they continue to operate as separate entities, then in order to consolidate those financial statements, because they keep their own separate set of books, but in order to consolidate for financial reporting purposes, we're going to use a worksheet, which can become a little more confusing. And the way that we do that, the parent company is the one that's going to be preparing consolidated financial statements. The parent has to show um, the allocation of the various assets on the acquisition date. And then in a worksheet um, scenario, we take the parent's assets and the subsidiary's assets and we close out any subsidiary revenue and expenses um, prior to this worksheet. And then from there, we get rid of the subsidiary's equity balances because again we've got to show it as one entity and get rid of um, the investment in the parent company as in chapter one we show that investment in the subsidiary as an asset we've got to get rid of that also and then assign goodwill or whatever that excess is a little more complicated we're gonna just take our time going through it um, but definitely when they maintain two separate identities, we still need to show on financial statements to the public that they're operating as one and all this is done through worksheets. So a little more involved, but we'll just take it one step at a time. Now, when we've got um, a consolidation, and there may be intangible assets, not the goodwill aspect, but intangibles. We have to decide if um, how to record that intangible. Generally speaking, with intangibles, they have to be purchased in order to show them on the books. And the criteria that are going to be met in this is, does that intangible asset come from a legal or contractual right and can we sell is it possible to sell that intangible asset um, separately from the company so another piece to look at I'm not going to spend any time worrying about the um, international standards versus gap now there okay. were some there were methods previously that um, were allowed and are no longer allowed for companies going forward. But companies that were um, purchased years ago as combinations had the ability to use um, what we call pooling of interest methods. And they might still need to be um, showing it in that fashion um, just because um, that's when they purchased it they had that ability to use it but going forward any business combinations um, that happen after 2009 can't use these methods so the purchase method the pooling of interest methods may be utilized for companies that were acquired prior to this date but any combinations that happen after that date you can't use these methods anymore um, let's see, uh, I'm not going to get into this aspect right now.
because I'm not going to even spend time talking about the pooling method. So what I'd like to do, and again, the best way to learn is just go problem after problem after problem. <clears throat> so let's go into some problems here in the book and be able to decipher um, the various methods. Okay, so uh, let me find my book here. Here we go. Do you have your book open to know what page the questions start on? Yeah, do you want to? The first page is 72. Okay, thank um, you. That's for problem one. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will provide for you the... Um, the um, answers to all these various questions um, showing, you know, what's a combination, you know, if we start here on the, right. um, the first one, what is a combination? It's the combining um, two different entities into a single economic entity. Um, and then it will go on here. Excuse me, where's my... Um, describe the difference between legal arrangements. Um, what does the term consolidated financial statements mean? Consolidated financial statements, um, and this is what we're really focusing on. They represent accounting information gathered from two or more separate companies. Although this information might be accumulated individually, it gets brought together to describe a single economic entity created by the business combination. So even though companies can be still operating and keeping separate sets of books, for the public, we need to show it as one company. Um, different ways in which they can combine by totally acquiring the assets um, and dissolving, you know, there's different ways in which we can do that. Okay, so let's take a look at um, number 11 here. Number 11 says, <clears throat> to obtain all of the stock of Molly Inc., Harrison Corporation issued its own common stock. Harrison had to pay 98000 to lawyers, accountants, and a stock brokerage firm in connection with services rendered during the creation of the business combination. Also, Harrison paid 56000 in costs associated with the stock issuance. How do these costs get recorded? So as you see here... Um, Oh, excuse me, where am I? The 98,000 and the 56,000, the various um, costs, the 98,000 um, for the, let me just make sure I'm saying it right. The 98,000 was being paid to the various um legal professionals um, associated. Um, so that amount will be expensed. Anything to do with services gets expensed. But any costs okay. that get associated with issuing stock get treated as a reduction in the APIC account. So this is going to be common. You can expense the services but stock issuance costs are going to go against the purchase of the company. So we'll, we'll have that over and over again in some of these problems here. Um, okay. Let's look at number... Uh, let's see here. 
Number 11. On June 1st, Klein paid $800,000 cash for all of the issued and outstanding common stock of Wren Company, Wren Corporation. Um, the carrying amounts of Wren's assets and Wren's liabilities show here. So we've got cash of 150, accounts receivable of 180, capitalized software 320, goodwill 100, liabilities minus 130. So a total net assets is 620, although they paid 800,000 for it. On June 1st, Wren's accounts receivable had a fair value of 140. See, so it's showing on the books of 180, but we know it's truly at 140, so that's what we're going to use. Additionally, Wren's in-process research and development was estimated to have a fair value of 200,000. All other items get stated at fair value. On Klein's June 1st consolidated balance sheet, how much is going to be reported for goodwill? So what we'll do here is we'll take the cash for 150, the accounts receivable at the true fair value of 140, the software of 320, the research and development costs it gave us of 200,000, the liabilities are minus 130, and we'll come up with the net assets and then from that determine the difference going to goodwill. So let me just kind of show you how we're going to do this. So in this scenario, cash 150, accounts receivable 140. So we'll show um, the We'll start with the consideration transferred, which was 800000 okay? Then from there, we'll come up with the fair value. The cash was 150 Then we've got our accounts receivable. Even on the books, they're showing higher. We know the value is 140 we know the software was at 320. Um, we know the research and development costs, or the asset for that was 200,000. The liabilities were a minus 130. So our fair value of what we call the net identifiable assets is going to be all of that, 680. Right. The difference is going to be goodwill. So the difference is the, what the consideration was versus the net identifiable assets. Goodwill is going to be reported here on the books at 120. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. The main difference here was the accounts receivable were stated higher, but the fair value as of the date of acquisition is less. We're not going to take into account the goodwill shown on the books because we're going to create our own goodwill. Okay? So if you see, look here, they show 100000 in goodwill, but we're taking that out because we're going to be creating our own goodwill based on the net identifiable assets. Let's look at <coughs> this next problem. On May 1st, Beasley paid 400000 in stock for all the assets and liabilities of Donovan, which will cease to exist as a separate entity. In connection with the merger, Beasley incurred 
15000 in accounts payable for legal and accounting fees. Beasley also agreed to pay 75000 to the former owners of Donovan, contingent on meeting certain revenue goals during the year. Beasley estimated the present value of its probability adjusted expected payment for the contingency at 20000 In determining its offer, Beasley noted that Donovan holds a building with a fair value of $30,000. Um, Donovan has developed un $30,000 more than its book value. Donovan's developed unpatented technology appraised at $25,000, even though it's not shown in the books. Donovan has a research and development activity in process with a fair value of forty-five, and book values for Donovan's current assets and liabilities approximate fair values. What should Beasley record as total liabilities incurred or assumed in connection with the merger? Now I'm going to get my book here because um, there are some contingent aspects that this book talks about that's not good in the PowerPoint. Here, one second. Okay. That I just want to go to that chapter and talk about real quick here. Excuse me. Um, I am not I do not like these PowerPoints. I should create my own because they don't really go through everything. Um... Let's see here. One second. Okay, let's just look a minute at page 54. <coughs> if you have your book, actually, I should put it up here, page 54. Um, related costs of business combinations. Three additional categories of costs typically accompany business combinations, regardless of whether dissolution takes place. First, firms often engage attorneys, accountants, investment bankers, and other professionals for related services. The acquisition method does not consider these expenditures as part of the fair value received by the acquirer. So these service fees get expensed in the current period. <clears throat> the second category concerns an acquiring firm's internal costs. Examples include secretarial management time allocated to the acquisition activity. These services also get expensed. Amounts incurred to register and issue securities in connection with the business comp combination, reduce the otherwise determinable fair value of those securities. So basically, if any services that get paid get expensed, but any costs in the um, related to the stock in acquiring and issuing shares get reduced against the, um, the, um, the capital account, the equity section. So as you see here, the services are going to be expensed, the salary exp services are expensed, but any cost to issue the stock or register the stock just get reduced from the equity section in the financial statements. It's not a cost or it's not an expense of the current period. Okay, it just reduces. Um, so just that's one issue. Another piece I wanted to address um, let me find it. Hmm. Let's see here. I guess 
I might be getting ahead of myself in another chapter. But um, okay. when we're dealing with what we call contingent liability, so if I get back on over here, um, uh, let's see what page, 74. In this scenario... Yeah, that, that there, is that, Nancy, is, when you say contingent liability, is that typically that you, the known debt of the company here? No, in this scenario, basically, as you see here, Beasley agreed to pay 75000 to the former owners contingent mm -hmm. on meeting certain um, revenue goals. So, yeah. basically, yeah. it's... It's, it's basically a fee to keep those owners engaged in the business. Got it. Okay? That makes sense. And so yep. they're, ex they're expecting, they're, ex they're saying they'll pay him 75 but Beasley then estimates that the chance... They're only going to get 20000 Yes. They're only going to get 20000 okay. okay? So mm -hmm. what do they need to show recorded as liabilities incurred or assumed in connection with this merger. So instead of using 75 here, because they anticipate the reality is it's 20,000, that's what we're gonna use. So okay. in this example, what the liabilities will be the legal and accounting um, fees, accounts payable, of fifteen thousand. Yep. Then there is the, that contingent liability to the owners to keep doing their job of twenty. Right. Okay. The, then the liabilities assumed by Donovan or the Beasley's assuming liabilities. Yep. It said. <laughs> Uh, where is it? It's 60. 60. Where, I'm just looking to see where I'm seeing that. Oh, the 60 is... Uh, oh, up here. Liability 60. Okay. So yeah. the liabilities of 60. So all the liabilities, this question asks, liabilities um, assumed are going to be the 95000 there. Okay? And that they have, they pay off the expense right off the top. That's Correct. That, right. They'll pay the expense okay. right off the top, and that will be shown as an yeah. expense, but it's a lie, you know, it's, it's an account payable. Right. Okay. <clears throat> the next one says, how much should Beasley rec be record as total assets acquired in this merger? So it tells us that um, Beasley, uh, let's see here, uh, is buying all these assets, but Donovan holds a building with a fair value, 30000 yeah. more than its books. So even though this shows two twenty, we're really acquiring it for two fifty. You know what I'm saying? Because this is the book value on the books is 220, but it's letting us know that the fair value oh, I, yeah. is really 250. It also yeah. it also tells us that Donovan has un developed unpatented technology appraised at 25,000, even though it's not in the books, but we know we're acquiring right. that. It also tells us Donovan. Yeah has research and development activities in process with a value of 45000 So the way we're going to calculate the fair value of the assets um, would be by taking the um, current assets. We're at 90. Ah. Current assets, 90. We've got the building and equipment at 
250. We've got the unpatented technology at 25. We've got the R&D asset at 45. Our liabilities are minus 60. Okay? So, yep. and we, the consideration given in this was 400, that, four, four, wasn't it 420? Four, well, oh, okay. no, sorry. no, you're right. It is this 400 plus this contingent 20. Okay. Uh, so we're really cons giving 420. And if we take into account the fair value of all the net assets here, 350, we know the difference has to be goodwill. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So what will show on the books <laughs> would be basically all of this, and then, of course, we would have to add Actually, what I'm going to do is this. So, the way our asset section would look Do you see what I'm saying? This is truly okay. what we're purchasing it for. Net assets would really be Yeah, 420. And yeah. I guess if I take away the liability, my assets are at 480. But that's how we right. come up with it. Okay. Then, let's see here. Let's look at number 14. I just find the best way to do this, Tawny, is just go through problems after problems. Yeah. Because each one gives you a little oh, different oh. scenario. Okay. <clears throat> Prior to being united in a business combination, Atkins and Watterson had the following stockholders equity figures. So it lets us know Atkins stock, additional paid in capital and retained earnings, and Watterson's. Atkins issued 51,000 new shares of its common stock valued at $3 per share for all the outstanding stock of Watterson. Immediately after, what are consolidated additional paid in capital and retained earnings? So Atkins is giving, um, issuing 51,000 shares valued at three bucks per share. So the common stock piece is going to be a dollar. The additional paid in capital is going to show that extra two bucks a share. Do you know what I'm saying? Because it was valued at three bucks a share. We know the par value stays right. in the common stock and the additional. Yeah. Okay. So in this scenario, what's it going to look like afterwards? We're going to show value of shares given, or I guess issued, is the 51,000 times three bucks a share, okay? Um, so equal 51,000 times three, 153. Then what we'll show in the equity section, the par value is at 51,000, right? A yeah. buck a share. Right. So the additional paid in capital on the new shares will be the difference here. Okay. Or 102,000. The additional paid in capital on the old shares Ah. 
are 90. See how that's 90? So the additional paid in capital on the old shares are 90,000. So our new consolidated additional paid in capital are going to be 192. It's going to be our 102 plus our 90. Because the question is, what will be the, the consolidated additional paid in capital? So basically, we've got the 90 here plus because of the new shares at 51,000 shares times two bucks goes into our additional paid in capital. After the, um, okay. after the combination, we'll show additional paid in capital on the books of 192. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the answer to the question is B then, right? The 192. Correct. Is Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> then next, the next part of it says, Um, oh, no, that's it. Okay, so let's do this one for the next that's couple. Yeah, we were going to have to do these Watersons, but they, that's not the case, right? Because they're consolidated. Correct. Up. Watterson is, is um, not going to show up at all. Because yeah. it's, it's just Atkins purchasing it. <clears throat> okay, now on problem 15. On July 1st, True Data Company issues 10,000 shares of its common stock with a $5 par value and a $40 fair value in exchange for all of Webstat's company's outstanding voting shares. Webstat's pre-combination book and fair values are shown along with True Data. So this shows the various accounts, and they purchased it on July 1st. So this is in the middle of the year. It's asking us, on the date of acquisition, what amount should true data report as goodwill? So basically, what we're having to do here is calculate what we're paying for it, what are the What's the book value of all the assets? What's the fair value? And allocating it to various accounts. Okay? So you see here, Web, right. Webstat gives us the book values. But we are going to record things at fair value. Okay? Because the book value are, is just historical cost. In this scenario, since we're truly purchasing the company, we're purchasing assets at fair value, not book value. Okay? So it's, right. it's telling us that it's purchasing Webstat for 10,000 shares at 40 bucks a share. So we're going to show... The consideration given or purchase, you know, or purchase um, right. given is 400000 Then we have to look at the um, fair value versus, right. so the, our fair value here is 60 The... Inventories 175, patented technologies 200, land is 225, building is 75, liabilities are at 350. Okay, so if we take, I need to, um, cash of 60, inventory of 175, so if we show our cash of 50, inventory, of 175 
patented technology of 200, land of 225, patented technology, I'm sorry, I can't keep up, of 200, land of 225, land of 225, Building and Equipment 75, and then our liabilities were at 350. Yeah. The net here, the net of the net fair value. would be 375. Let me see what I'm doing wrong. Book value. Hi, but I was going to ask you why you got 50000 for cash when it's 60. That's it. It's 385. So the goodwill that we will show on our books is going to be the difference or we're going to show the goodwill at 15,000. Okay. See how I'm doing that? Yes, I do. The next question says, on the acquisition date consolidated balance sheet, what amount should true data report as patented technology? So, patented technology should be true data's patented technology here is 230. Okay? 230, yes. And web stats, fair values at 200. So the patented technology shown on True Data's consolidated financial statements should be 430. It should be a result of um, True Data patented technology of 230. WebStat patented technology from up here, see, the fair value right. of 200, so the total should be, sure, 430, yep, this is on the consolidated financial statement for patented technology. Okay? Yeah. Next. <clears throat> On its acquisition date consolidated balance sheet, what amount should true data report as common stock? So if you think about this, we're not going to deal with anything with WebStats common stock. We're only dealing with true data. Now, prior to this acquisition, true data had 300,000 in common stock. Okay? And yeah. then they purchased an additional, or they issued an additional 10,000 shares with a $5 par value. So, the common stock that should be shown after this acquisition should be what they originally showed of um, 300,000 true data common stock prior to acquisition was 300,000 and then common stock issued at par was at five bucks a share, wasn't it? And so this would be um, 10,000 shares 
at five bucks a share or fifty thousand. So the common stock account account at acquisition should show three fifty. Right. We're not going to show anything with the you know the other company. Then it asks us, on its acquisition date consolidated balance sheet, what amount should True Data report as retained earnings as of July 1st? So we see here the retained earnings of True Data prior to this is 130. Yeah. Then we know pro, um, their revenues and expenses from January through June 30th for True Data. Right. Revenues of 250, expenses of 170, with a net of 80,000. You know what I'm saying? The net income here is 80. Yeah. And so. 80. To create new financial statements as of this date, we'll take that eighty thousand for the first six months and add that to our retained earnings. Because it's asking us what will be the retained earnings as of this date. So we'll take true data's one one retained earnings of one thirty and then add in true data's net income for the first six months of 80. Ah! So as of July 1st, retained earnings, True data is going to show 210. Nothing okay. with the other company gets is not is right. there's nothing with the other company we're going to deal with there. Okay. <laughs> Let's look at number 20. How are you doing so far, Tani? Am I go am I going too fast for you? No, no, I'm catching up. It's kind of funny because I'm working in Excel as you are, and every once in a while I see your, what you're doing, and I think I'm the one typing. I love it. <laughs> I love it. So it's, we're good. We're good. Okay. Number 20. The following book and fair values are available for Westmont as of March 1st. So it gives us the various book values. But it, it adjusts for some fair values of the inventory has gone down, the land has gone up, the building's up. There's something that's not on the books of Westmont, customer relationships that we'll have to add. Okay? So our Turo company pays $4 million cash and issues 20,000 shares of its $2 par value common stock. Now it's telling us the fair value is at 50 bucks a share for all of Westmont's common stock in a merger, after which Westmont will cease to exist as a separate entity. Stock issue costs amount to 25,000 and Arturo pays 42,000 for legal fees to complete this transaction. Prepare Arturo's journal entry to record its acquisition to Westmount. So let's just kind of look, and, and we'll, we'll put it down, but let's just kind of look at the figures. We know we're going to show as the assets acquired, the inventory is going to be at 600000 not 630 because we're really purchasing the fair value. The land is right. going to be fair at... Value. Mm -hmm. yeah. The land's going to be at 990. The building's at 2 million. We'll add the customer relationships 
at 800,000, <coughs> we'll have to show the accounts payable at 80, but we're going to need to figure out what we're showing in Goodwill, don't we? So the way we're going to figure yeah. out what we're showing in Goodwill is by determining what are we purchase, acquiring it for and what are the fair value of all the assets. So we're acquiring it for 4 million plus 20,000 shares at 50 bucks a share. So um, consideration given, consideration given is really the 4 million and then 50 bucks a share at 20, that's a million, isn't it? 50, 20,000, a million. So we're really giving 5 million, right? Yeah. That's what we're really purchasing it for, 5 million. We are purchasing the, are the assets acquired, 600000 for inventory, right? Excuse me, assets acquired. Yeah. The inventory of 600000 the land of 990 the buildings of $2 million, customer relationships of 800000 so, and the accounts payable minus 80. So the net assets acquired are 3 million 590. What am I doing wrong here? Oh. oh, I know what I'm doing wrong. I'm real I the consideration given is five million, but we're actually issuing stock an additional paid in capital of a million. Do you know what I'm saying? So really, oh, that should be four million. Okay. Let me just see what I'm doing wrong. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, I'm taking. I'm not taking into account. My what it's is? 800, uh, your customer relations number is supposed to be 800. Stuff. That's where I'm screwed up. Yeah. Okay. There go. So if I do yep. 5 million, let me just see here. Then you get, um, at least I got 690. Okay, that's right. correct. That's what we want our goodwill to be. 690. Okay. I'm so sorry. So 690. That's okay. 690 is what we need to report in Goodwill, okay? In Goodwill, okay. So we needed to, to do this calculation in order to determine what we're going to record on our journal entry as Goodwill. So that was my first step here. So, right. okay. so that was step one to determine what's our Goodwill. Now this question asks us... Um, prepare the journal entry to record this acquisition. So we are going to show a journal entry to show all the assets we're acquiring, the debt that we're, we're acquiring. The difference is going to be goodwill. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, the the 690, or, um, 690 and goodwill. And then 
<coughs> we're going to show the cash we gave. Okay. And then we'll also show the credit for the common stock and the additional paid in capital. So all okay. of all of this gets recorded into one journal entry. So to record the um, acquisition um, of the um, the transaction for this, we're going to show again. Actually, I'm just going to cut and paste up here. We're going to show first of all our inventory of 600. Ah. Ah. Okay, so we're going to show our inventory of 600, our land of 990, our buildings of 2 million, our customer relationships of 800,000, our goodwill of 690. Okay, then our accounts yep. payable of 80, the common stock we issued told us we issued 20,000 shares at $2 par value, okay, so 20,000 shares at 2 bucks par value would be common stock of 40,000. Then the additional paid in capital would be 20,000 shares, but it has a fair value of 50 bucks a share. The par was two, so the difference, the 48 bucks a share, times 20,000 shares is what we're going to show in additional paid in capital. So that's going to be the 20,000 shares. Actually, I'll just do it this way. 20,000 shares times 48 bucks or 960,000 would be our additional paid in capital. Okay. And then our cash is 4 million. Let me just make sure that my debits equal my credits. Right. So this would show the journal entry to acquire the company. Okay. Now the other piece we need to show relates to the costs. It told us Stock issuance costs were twenty-five thousand, and Arturo pays forty-two thousand for legal fees. So technically, we need to also show the journal entry to show professional fees expense of forty-two. We need to show cash for that of 42 but then the stock issuance costs get offset in additional paid in capital of 25,000 and cash of 25,000 remember those aren't an expense they go against the equity account right Does that make sense If you don't mind, I am going to...